So thank you guys again for joining this evening um, to talk about augmented reality and how it's, you guys are all utilizing it as an art form. Um, I will start in and I'm Brian Scalic. I work at REM5, wear a lot of hats, including being a general marketing director and hosting things like this because I also help run our arts program, which at REM5, we have an event that we've been building called ESC, which is the Experiential Sensory Collective, which all of our panelists here today have been a part of in some way, shape or form over the past two events. Uh, we are very eagerly looking forward to eventually doing a V3 in the fall or sometime. Um, but it's also been a good opportunity to take a step back and have these kind of conversations um, and stay connected and always see what everybody is kind of working on uh, in this time where some of us have a lot more time to work on stuff and some of us uh, things have changed in uh, different ways as well. So let's just hop on in. I will let you guys all introduce yourselves. Um, basically, just give us a quick little overview. You can talk a little bit about your background with AR and kind of how you got into it. Um, and we'll start with Zach, how's that sound? All right. Um, I'm Zach Chapman. I uh, am a developer at a pixel farm. Um, I sort of got into AR. Um, I started as a, with a degree in uh, game design and development with a concentration in art. Um, I sort of got into um, developing and coding as a way to like, yeah, do cool new things with the uh, art stuff I'm making. Um, I jumped at an opportunity to work with uh, VR at Pixel Farm. And while I was there, I also taught myself uh, AR Core, um, primarily use a Unity, which is a game development software. And it has integrations for AR and VR. And so I started making stuff in that. And I've also done some Snapchat filters and stuff. And yep. Awesome. All right, let's uh, come down to John. So um, I'm John Bumstead. Um, I'm, I got into visual art, I guess, uh, because I started refurbishing computers 12 years ago. And, um, you know, I'd get thousands of broken computers and fix them and sell them. And, um, you know, I'd noticed that a lot of them had broken screens and the broken screens were interesting. So I'd take a picture and um, I, I, I do photography like uh, flowers and trees. So I'd bring up my pictures behind the broken screen and I'd see that it looked you know, you could see you could see the the broken screen affecting the image, and so I take a picture of that, uh, and then I found out that a lot of the machines, the laptops, had bad uh, GPUs, uh, graphics processors, um, and though they would, uh, it's called artifacting. They would show a visual representation of the the bad GPU on the screen, um, and so I'd bring my pictures in behind the, the, um, the, the GPU defect and take pictures of that, and. Um, and so now I have like a couple hundred machines that have uh, all sorts of defects and I use them as kind of uh, filters um, for my photography. And I also do layers. So if I want a little bit of this effect, I'll bring it up on this laptop, take a picture, bring it up on that laptop, take a picture. So it's just this kind of quirky thing where instead of using like, you know, Photoshop filters or something, um, I'm, I just have all these, these broken machines. Um, so that's kind of my background um, art wise. And um, for AR, it's just um, it's just a way to, I, I see that as just sort of a way to have fun, to just see my art in a completely different context. And, um, you know, Brian, you told me about Torch. Um, you know, that's, that's how I got into that. The Torch is sort of the environment, the AR environment that I use that's a really um, pretty amazing tool. Uh, it's very, very accessible. And um, yeah, I've just never looked back, I've gone I gone ahead using that. Oh. Awesome. Thanks, John. And last but certainly not least, Ms. Hattie. Yeah, so I'm Hattie Ball. Um, I'm a new media artist, um, but I work predominantly with AR, VR, and 3D animation, um, creating like interactive experiences and immersive experiences. Uh, my backgrounds are actually in fine art and art history. That was what I did at college. Um, but it was like a really broad course and I ended up specializing in um, new media art and the history of new media art and kind of how that's developed as a contemporary art practice. 
And uh, through that, I kind of went from using video um, for fine art film and then kind of went around that down that route of new media art and net art and kind of did this art history spiral into contemporary digital art. And then ended up just teaching myself how to use gaming engines um, and 3D software like Maya and ZBrush and Substance Painter and kind of all the software that you need to make 3D assets. Um, I use gaming engines as well, mostly Unity. Um, and I've just started delving into Unreal as well. Um, yeah, and AR has kind of just been it started off as just another tool I wanted to experiment with. I wasn't really sure what I was going to do with it. Um, and I've kind of been using it currently as a way of looking at um, how virtual space exists in the physical world and how that's something that we can use AR to represent the physical space that digital matter actually takes up. So that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. Awesome. Uh, super cool. Well, that, that last point actually will help drive into my first question for everybody. Um, I also wanted to take a step back uh, because I just want to start with a very general definition of what we're talking about with AR, especially mostly in the, in the cases of how um, all four of us have been utilizing it. So with when you talk about VR, so for virtual reality in general, we're going to make some more broad claims here because we don't want to have to get super nitty gritty. Um, that's using hopping into something like this. This is a, an Oculus Go to basically put someone completely into a virtual space. So they're no longer connected to the real world, if you will. Um, and what a lot of us have been utilizing AR with, where's my phone, uh, is to take something like a phone or an iPad and basically cr utilize the world around us, but have a, a digital layer of sorts between you and that physical world. So anything from a lot of people um, using Pokemon Go, where you're, you know, you might be looking at your street, but all of a sudden there's a Pokemon there that's in your phone, but not in the real world, uh, or Snapchat and uh, Instagram face filters that are basically, you know, taking an input, changing it, uh, augmenting the reality that you're seeing. So that's just, we can go deeper into the, that, but just a rudimentary discussion of kind of what we'll be talking about of using some type of technology as a medium between us and the real world. So, so like, like Hattie said about some of, uh, some of your work um, showing kind of what digital matter looks like in, a, in our space and what it takes up, I was kind of wondering what, what has inspired the three of you in using AR to, to want to augment the world around you to take, you know, what you're what you're seeing at base reality and, and change that and warp that to, uh, to create something, you know, magical or, or different. And we can, we can start with whoever. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I think uh, ma magic's kind of the word, uh, at least for me, the, cause it does feel like a sort of a using the device as a window into another world. Mm -hmm. um, I got into this sort of field of technology looking for, you know, re being really into like game design and creating new spaces. Um, but I like the sort of how accessible it is to use a mobile device as a window into something new and the ability to, you know, show something where it is and then, um, yeah, you can bring stuff back out of that world and see it in your world with the uh, uh, AR. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I agree. It's, it's, it's magical. I mean, the first time I used Torch, I was um, in a shopping mall uh, with my fiance and I was waiting for her. I was bored out of my mind waiting for her to try on clothes or something. And so I just started opening up a lot of my images in Torch in the shopping mall, like wallpapering the mall with my images and, and putting them out there 50 feet tall and you know people were walking through them and it's just it was just a rush like it was just I, I knew then that there was uh, something to it and um, and for me it kind of as far as the real world versus the computer world like it, it's it goes back to what I was saying about layering I think um, it just allows me to create more layers you know instead of I mean I have a bunch of big broken TVs and I'm putting you know partly translucent images in front of the broken TVs, um, multiples of them, 
and then you know looking through them at the TV and then taking photographs of of that you know the, this digital element plus the the television. So it's, it's for me it's just another way to add layers into um, into the art that I was already doing. Awesome. Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah, I agree with you guys saying it's kind of like this magical thing, especially when you first get into it. It's it does it creates it turns a screen into a portal, so it's sort of like transporting you into this other world that's in another realm but it's you know partially in the 3d world that you're looking at and the physical world that you exist in and when you're looking at that screen and that screens for you it's like this portal into another reality that uh, everything in it everything you're looking at through it is unconsciously participating in it um and that's just a really exciting position to be in when you're experiencing it but also when you've made it um yeah and i think for me it's sort of gone beyond that into like the kind of conceptual idea of like um, AR kind of examining the materiality of virtual space and how it exists beyond the screens um, and how it can inhabit the spaces that we exist in physically, but we might not see the, the digital things happening around us. Um, yeah, looking at how we use space with AR is really interesting. And uh, when we, we did a show at um, MCAD, the Limitless Spaces show yeah. with you, Brian, and I had an AR piece in there and it was just interesting to see how people, when people use it, they, they're interacting with the physical space, but they also lose all scope of everything going on around them as well and just walk into each other and walk across people. And you kind of, you're so sucked into this alternate physical space that you lose uh, kind of grip on what's actually going on around <laughs> you as well. Yeah, I mean, and definitely, of course, a common, uh, a common issue with VR as well of, you know, these different layers of, of, of really just uh, of how are we affecting the optical nerves of the, of the <laughs> viewer in a way that, uh, you know, yeah, you don't have to put a helmet on them, but watch your step and, you know, it, but, but it's also cool that people can be so entranced that the basic functions of moving around are, are corrupted by, by what you've made, which is, uh, you know, definitely exciting and interesting. So, um, one more quick call out. If anybody watching uh, on Facebook or Zoom has any questions, feel free to post them in the chat or live. I will try to, or into the Facebook comments. Um, I'll try to look and check for those too so we can just pop them in at any time. Um, but also maybe let's, this might be a good chance to jump back to you, John. Um, first off, for everybody watching, the images behind John are the ones that he's been talking about. You can see the uh, the glitching and the artifacts and the really beautiful colors um, that he's made. Uh, but John, if you have, if you want to share your screen, we can talk a little bit more um, and show some of the AR work that you've done and, and talk through a little bit of that just to kind of root people oh, sure. closer to that work. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Can you guys see it? Awesome. Yeah. All right, so these are images of mine that I have sort of, I've or overlaid sort of a grid onto them and cut them out. And, um, and you know, obviously they're partly transparent. And, and I, I love uh, moir patterns, which are, you know, patterns overlaid onto each other that then produce emergent patterns. And one thing that's great about AR is that you can do uh, moir patterns that couldn't exist in, in, in reality. Um, because you know you have the, the the patterns and the objects moving through each other, and um, so you know this is an example of torch, um, and you know torch lets you spin things, it lets you have interactions, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, so this is just another uh, scene that I made um, where this is all my art. It's just sort of a creative way to. Uh, to showcase, uh, you know, the art, put it in a box like this. Mm -hmm. And um, I, this video doesn't show it, but there are interactions enabled. So you can click on the objects or the images and they will, um, yeah, that's my kitchen there. Um, and they, they get bigger, they shrink, they, they flip around, they do all kinds of things. So um, it's, it's kind of fun to play with. Mm -hmm. And then there's a third one here. So this is at ESC, 
Um, I had two iPads in Torch in the same space mirrored to uh, screens, as you can see there. And um, so they, they could, the people can choose to be in the same scene or not, but if they're in the same scene, then they're essentially uh, in AR uh, on iPads in the same space, which was uh, um, a lot of fun to see. You know, you, you, you create these things, uh, these sort of playgrounds for people to mess around in, and um, you know, you think that uh, you know what they're going to do, um, but then um, th they get in there and th they do other things than you would expect. They they completely surprise you. They they try to break the uh, you know the program. They try to uh, you know make an object fill the whole space, and you know it's just it's it's really a learning experience. It's an educational experience. You know you think. You think you're showing something to people, but then they show you <laughs> a lot more, and and it's really educational, and um, you kind of you kind of get the the knowledge you need to go back for another round with 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 what you learn. The the wild world of uh, actually showing interactive installations to <laughs> to other humans besides ourselves. Um, <laughs> I wonder that's that actually brings up a really good point maybe for uh, for Zach or, or Hattie and and you've you've alluded to it we talked about kind of how people utilize it but but just thinking about that a little bit too of you know a lot of us especially in this COVID time you know we we're just eyes down we're not interacting face to face with a lot of people and so you know we're doing these these tests or we're we're playing with these programs kind of in a silo that when we take them out to the real world or to the to a lay person that you're just, you know, especially for John's was a great example where it's like, here's the iPad, like, you know, there's not a ton that you need to know, which is great that people can just get really involved into it. But but like, yeah, what what have you guys seen as far as interesting results from from like the public actually trying something out for the first time? Um. Um, so um, in my work with uh, Pixel Farm, we actually uh, did a uh, an advertisement that was a uh, AR app, um, and that was a whole lot of you know simultaneously trying to anticipate how people are going to use it, and like leverage the interesting things about AR, and also um, you know waiting for it to hit the real world and expand on that, um, and so. Yeah, um, we are one of the things I realized and I it became a ma major important thing in the uh, design of that is that uh, when you display AR um, screen captures aren't great if you aren't moving. And like one of the really because the magic of it is seeing both the space and the the window or the view through it. And it's also if you're showing somebody AR and you hold out a device to them and they look at it, they aren't impressed. But if you hand them dev the device and they grab it and they realize as I move, the world moves and I can move around, that's the aha, the, the eureka moment where they really get that this AR is happening. Yeah, I think it's interesting that, that physical, being in control of something, of what you're seeing and the, the movement that goes with AR that, that makes that the spatial reality, it exists in the spatial reality is something that I think um, that is, like you said, that is what really makes people interested because it's it's this like 360 thing that's, it really feels like it's in the space immediately. And so I think at the moment, because um, people are using like social media a lot more, Instagram and Facebook, I think face filters, are, everyone's trying to use face filters at the moment. And it's also something that people feel connected with and um, multiple people will use them and then Instagram has the feature where like if you use it if you see some somebody use it you can then snag it and use it for yourself and you end up seeing this daisy chain of all the people you know mm -hmm. that use this filter and um, that's something where you know you're experiencing that in the moment while you're doing it so it's that entertainment for you but then it's also being sent out to everyone else so it has this like connectivity that goes with it as well so face filters I think they're also just like, I mean, I mess around with Spark AR and it's also just something fun to play around with when you're just like, oh, I want to do some, something that's interactive and AR based and this will just be an easy thing to play around with and yeah. mess around with textures and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, those are, those are things that people can do 
on their own in small spaces, I suppose, that still those platforms they use for allows people to feel connected through them. Um, in terms of making AR, it's difficult because so much of when I make something, it's hard to know what the next step is until I've let somebody try and use it. Cause there's like you guys are saying, there's so, so much of what the next step is and how something develops is based on how people react to it. Cause in my head, I could be like, this is how it's meant to be used. But if you don't tell somebody that they're just going to do something completely different, which you would never have thought of, like John said. So it's going to be interesting to see how projects I'm working on now will be received later. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Really good. Really good points. Um, I was going to actually, you wanted to come back maybe to Zach quick. You, you've been tying in um, some work with, with pixel farm and as kind of as a, as a professional developer. Um, and we've, we've had good conversations too about kind of, uh, you know, the UI in these, in these situations and how people are experiencing both AR and VR. So I was, I was wondering when you, um, from like a, a client project, mm -hmm. what are some considerations that you guys think about in that process of creating AR for maybe more of a marketing or advertising mm -hmm. piece rather than maybe one of the more kind of artistic outlet that you've used AR for? Like what are the kind of the comparison and, and uh, contrast those two sides yep. of it? Um, well, I guess, yeah, in, the uh, advertising sort of case, like the priority of your project is going to be to get the uh, the client's message out. Um, and whereas like in a <clears throat> more creative thing, I, I really like to encourage exploration. Um, so a project I worked on recently, or yeah, I worked on recently um, was for uh, Finnegan's and they had a, uh, the, the, message that uh, they wanted to get out was that they were, you know, hijacking a TV with AR to show their Super Bowl ad because they couldn't afford the actual Super Bowl spot. Um, and that is a very specific uh, uh, project. And we had to go through a lot of Q&A to tell the user how to exactly place this virtual cube right over their own TV. Um, and that took a lot of like, putting screens on the, or putting instructions in their screen and making 3D instructions that point to what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and the result of that was pretty impressive, but also did not take great use of the, the medium because in the end, the reward was a like two minute TV spot, which was entertaining. It was pretty funny, but it meant the user had to stand like this for two minutes to enjoy it. Um, but in, or, or in order to uh, extend that and bring some like interest and in, improve engagement with the device, we added a second mode where, um, we, so we were offering the user a virtual beer and it was just a little toy that uh, you can find a surface and place a beer can on and it'll drop. And then you press it again and another virtual beer can will drop. And you do it again and it'll fall on the other ones. You can try to stack them up. Oh, cool. And really? so, yeah, so that, that allows people, and I think did a lot better job of actually showing the medium mm -hmm. and while also being another tagline for the ad. And like when I showed people th them, you know, they sat for the thing and then handed them with the vet toy and they would uh, just place them all over. Mm -hmm. I showed it to my dad and he would, unprompted send me screenshots of his desks that he covered in beer cans or somebody else's <laughs> desk. Nice. That's really interesting. Um, I think with AR as a tool, I guess with marketing and doing something for a client like that, it's sort of like so much of what they want is this like narrative thing mm -hmm. and it's a narrative based thing. And that's a lot of like, I guess with advertising or marketing, it's like trying to give a brand or give a company this narrative. And I think AR is such a hard thing to do that with because it is just so like simple and interactive and nothing happens until you interact. And the simpler it is, the better sometimes. Well, most of the time I find with AR, um, VR is a bit more like if there's a narrative there, you can figure it out or you make your own narrative as you go, depending on how it's built. But I could imagine that having somebody want, they want the technology because it's like, amazing yep. and it's cool and it's fun to use but they want it to tell a story which is that's hard with AR it's 
sometimes it works so much better when it's like make your own story. <laughs> yeah, it's it's tricky. I mean, there have been a lot of times where it, AR can be hard. I mean, you get an idea in your head and you have this thing in your head that's perfect and it's working and it makes sense. And then you create it and it's like, oh, not really. That didn't really, <laughs> that really is what, wasn't what I thought, you know. So then you have to kind of iterate and, and kind of, you know, get it to the point that you uh, expected it to be at, if it does at all, you know, maybe that was just a, a bad idea and you, I needed to move on, you know. Yeah, and I think it's, it's also very telling how, so when I will make something and interact with it, I'll do it a certain way because of many reasons. And when someone else interacts with what you make, you realize like how much of who they are and their experiences with certain things like play a role in how they approach something and how they approach what you've made. And you're like, oh yeah, their mind is looking at this in a totally different way. So the effect sure. is different. And that's always a really interesting thing to see when someone's interacting with your work as well. Yeah, all your assumptions get blown away by someone else's perspective, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and that, and that brings up a really good point um, from Hattie as well that, that I hadn't really thought about going into this is like the, uh, the time frame of interaction for the different mediums and, and clearly it, between AR and VR are different because, you know, I'll, I'll pop this on and watch, and watch a, a 20 minute narrative because it's so immersive and I mean, it was from the Tribeca Film Festival, so it was really well done, but uh, I can sit and do that. But do you think it's because of, of accessibility and of phone culture and social media that some of the AR things that we're playing with are seen as, like you said, they want to be quick and simple and they can still be very cool, but I may not spend as much time with something made, made in AR as far as longevity of, of that goes. What do, what do you guys kind of think about that? Well, uh, I guess personally, I feel like um, part of it is there aren't AR experiences, or m there aren't many valuable or available that really take advantage of the form. Mm -hmm. um, you can't just, you know, put a video on a box and or and have it make, be engaging AR. I think the AR strength comes in a person walking around and being able to move around. And maybe a technique like um, leaving breadcrumbs around a room may be more engaging and allow for that sort of experience. But it's hard to hard to make or yes, set a value of you know just hold your phone like this and watch something in your room if uh, that's all that's happening when you could just set it down and watch a video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think with um, with AR, it's sort of it's how there's there's certain things you can do with it i think to create a narrative that engages people more it's like if you, you can make it into a mission with it for example like geotagging with things and doing mm -hmm. like geographical locations like pokemon go it's like if you go here if you walk this far you'll encounter something um and that's a really interesting thing to do is and that's something that i match i actually really want to do more with is those geo locations where it's like if you go to this certain spot, you'll find something. So you getting there is part of that AR experience and part of the mission, and, you know, but it's kind of like, you have to have a, some amount of instruction being like, you need to get to this place to find, it's like finding an Easter egg in a video game, I guess. It's like more things will pop up along the way. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, it's weird, like with VR and AR and even like 3D animation, you kind of have to get people somehow like sync their mindset into the right situation. Cause I think with VR, um it's that step closer to like a screen in some ways so people will sometimes put it on and be like nothing's happening like what's going on and expect like this thing to unfold and if it's interactive sometimes i find that people will be like i like i, I don't know i didn't expect to just have to do stuff so i'm going to take it off because that's not where my mind was when i put this on um you know whereas like with a 3d animation it's like you're sitting there and you you know you're meant to sit and watch this narrative happen like a movie and I think people, it's still because you're using screens, it's still trying to like get people past that, like, well, this is a screen. So I sit and things unfold before me and kind of getting people into that, like, this is also up to you and you can do certain things. And, and I mean, in, in the reverse, like I've done a lot of VR videos where people put on and they're like, oh, I just look around. And then they're like, well, that I did, I wanted to pick something up, you know, it's kind of, mm -hmm. it's, 
people go into it with different mindsets, I suppose, on like what the level of interactivity should be or how they want it to be. Yeah. A lot of the AR tools are starting to get better at having interactions, um, like, you know, sizing things, moving things, be able to, able to drag objects around. Um, you know, if you look at something, it, it, it reacts to being looked at directly. Uh, proximity, you walk into the proximity of something and that triggers something to happen. Um, you know, I have a friend who's a, a sound artist and we want to do something where there, there, there could be maybe dozens of objects around and just by running around, you'd trigger like unique combinations of sound. Yeah. So I, I think the tools are, are getting there. I think it's, it, it's, it's moving from something that's mostly just kind of static and you look around and say, oh, this is nice to something that is more interactive. So it's got a ways to go, but I think it's, it's getting there. Yeah, and I also think, um, like when you showed your piece, John, with the, the, this kind of like, it's almost like a small room with your pieces of work in there. I think for people when it's like, it's sort of like that kind of references this idea of like an art gallery kind of space where it's like these things are there and it's that familiar format, but then it's like, oh, you can interact and it makes that mm -hmm. familiar thing like that bit more exciting. So people, there's something that's like familiar that they like, oh, I step into this and I understand this format. But then that, those extras of interactivity mm -hmm. is like that bonus and that real kind of feeling of like, you're not just looking, but you're like aiding in the creation of something when you use it as well. Sure, sure kind of gamifies it in a way, you know? Yeah, definitely. Awesome. No, some really, really good thoughts. Um, and I think that that leads up to, to wondering, like, what, what do we all see as the future of, of AR uh, for the pur purposes of this panel as, as an art form? I know there's always the classic, you know, that they live and like the smart glasses where we're going to be walking and there's just going to be ads hitting us in the face all the time. But but I think as, as stuff unfolds between a mix of, um, you know, using images that can trigger AR and like you said, geolocation and a lot of John's uh, stuff with Torch that can really anchor in spaces that, um, for me at least, it would be that I can go into a space either, especially like REM5, some projects we were working on, and, and open up my phone and, and um, kind of reveal this secret world that's hidden in plain view, you know. Um, to make it kind of scavengery hunt or that people can collaborate on a location and, and kind of have it be that there's a lot of stuff being made. It's not overwhelming us, but if we choose to opt in to, to find or contribute it, that I think that would be, that would be really cool because then it's like, well, maybe it's a bad reason for us to open our phones more, but then it's just kind of a, an exciting, more, like you said, kind of a gamified, a, 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 a hidden world that we can open up. So that's that's something that I've been thinking about. Anyone else as far as like what the future um, of AR art looks like? It, it really has a way to go in terms of getting more people into the same environment. I, I think I think that's key. Um, like even in, in the scene that I showed at, at ESC where two people are in the same space, they're really not in the same space. They're, they're in two different instances of the same thing. So it gives the illusion of the same space. But if we can get to a point where um, you know, multiple people can, to, can truly be in the same environment, I think that will be a plus. You know, Torch um, is in the cloud. So one nice thing about Tor that, that is that you, you can- uh, <laughs> Oh, funny. <laughs> one nice thing about Torch is you can, um, you know, it's in the cloud so you can send people a link and then you know a thousand people in theory could could, could be in your experience at the same time um you know so things like that um and in terms of the future i think i think vr and ar are really going to merge i i really i don't understand why you know vr glasses don't already have front-facing cameras so that you can you know realize the real world world objects you know i think especially when you know VR, AR, um, you know, glasses come out you know, for real this next time, uh, mm -hmm. things like that. I, I think we're, we're really just going to see the two merge, and uh, I, I think that will be the future. I think I think it makes most, more sense than separating them into these these two two different buckets. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean that's that's such a good point as far as like, uh, yeah, there's not there's there's all these separate apps, and that's something I think we've all run into. Is that like, I want to put something out to everybody, but like, okay, download this app, 
have this QR code or this, you know, a special link to it uh, or download it directly. And there's so many steps that, that are just barriers to, instead of like, all right, I just painted this peak picture. I'm going to take a photo of it and put it on Facebook. And now everybody is seeing that painting. Um, yeah. It's like, a, is there like, um, you know, the emoji Unicode for AR that, that they can all just play nice across platforms, across yeah. apps that, that we're in this environment together. So yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the perfect world. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think uh, that's the thing is like, for something to really uh, become commonly used by a lot of people, it has to kind of be something that even like the lesser tech savvy, tech interested people see it as something that they have a necessity for or they want to or becomes yeah. part of the everyday process. I think you're right. And I think, uh, you know, the when you have like Android or iOS, there's some kind of universal thing that's built into these devices that just work like when people don't have to download things. And I think, I do think it will get there. Um, and it's interesting because I wonder if it will become the space that anybody can create and put things in, in which case then you'd have like issues of cens censorship and what gets mm -hmm. put in these spaces that yeah. anyone can throw anything in and it exists in this huge platform, kind of like a second life sort of thing. That's like in this mm -hmm. AR world. And that would be another thing, you know, you'd, you'd have this kind of like, camera like tool but there'd be like community guidelines all these other things that would probably have to be incorporated yeah. but um yeah i mean that i think steps are happening like i've started just using um usdz files which i only just heard about which are ar files that work with ios and it's a way that you can export 3d files mm -hmm. with animation sometimes when it's not glitchy um but you use it on a mac through like running the command line and putting code in there and it's just a file that you can send to somebody via text or email and they just open it and it just opens with your camera on iOS and it just works. So that's kind of like a simpler step. Um, so far it's pretty basic. I just know you can do like singular 3D files and export animations to from like 3D software, but it's one less step of being like, download this app or make this account and link it to this. It's like, you just open this file. So mm -hmm. that's an interesting thing to see if that develops. Mm. Um, yeah, and I, I think definitely what John was saying about incorporating like the VR, AR kind of experience where you can have somebody who's experiencing one thing that's totally immersive and somehow like it can be seen by everyone else in this space or something that they're making in VR can be experienced through like another screen in that space simultaneously. I think that would be interesting to see how that happens. I think I remember um, Matt Foreman talking about working with that that kind of thing, like making VR experiences um, viewable through people not in the headset somehow. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, no, that was, uh, what was I just thinking of? Sorry, did, did somebody else have something else on that point? Well, I was just gonna build on uh, what Hattie and John sort of said. Yeah. Um, talking about, yeah, I think, It'll be cool to see if AR can become a form of self-expression, um, sort of like if we if there is a more universal platform to be able to you know place your geocache and tell people to go find it, mm -hmm. or to even possibly put AR things on yourself, and other people can see you through the right lens as whatever you want to project and self yeah, you know that's cool do it that way. But um, see me just, as I really am. Yeah. I know like, when you, you like you talk about those things and you get all these like in my head it's these crazy sci-fi visuals yeah. <laughs> it quickly turns into a weird episode of Black Mirror but I mean yeah. well, <laughs> things end up it's weird things that end up like creeping in a lot more gradually so they're, they're not as like crazy and overwhelming when you do yeah. that happening but it might be a time where we look back on it and we're like oh wow like we've come so far you know everybody uses these things now and yeah what was a mix of what was it the white christmas episode where if someone wants you to like never see them again like you, their face gets blurred yeah. out and they're like they're all, like you don't exist to them anymore and that, that's what yeah. that reminded me of or i was even thinking too where it's like it's a piece of jewelry you know or like a headband that, that really is you know a qr code or a triggered thing that that serves as a functional you know piece yeah. of wear that actually has something else built into it like that's super cool too that's double identity and like you know building on yeah. a persona that you know. it's going to be like the sims we'll have this little green triangle above them. <laughs> yeah. Every, everybody's just going to walk around in black jumpsuits with qr codes yeah 
And you can just what should I wear off. today? Just I mean, we're 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 pretty close. I mean, as we're talking about using a lot of these different apps to like hack stuff together, you know, that's not that the, between the four of us, like we could come up with something that that would do that, and that's that's yeah. pretty wild. That's uh, that's yeah. pretty cool. Um, because yeah, we we were chatting about before we went live of the uh, of Snapchat's new camera that can kind of overlay on Zoom meetings, where it's that exact concept of. They in their demo they show like Twitch streamers, you know, being inside of a um, PUBG, I think is the game. Don't the internet's gonna kill me. In like a helmet that you know they're streaming, but they they've got a tie into the game or they're some type of um, you know like a World of Warcraft character. That this is another step into this immersive and and like you said, kind of into story and and these in these cultures that we're building around digital whether it's games um anyways so so that's that's really cool and as we chatted about that you know snapchat's rolling out stuff like that because of the times that we're currently in you know it's like how can we be relevant and giving people tools that they can use every single day and and make things a little bit you know more fun which i think is something we all try to do with with, with ar especially yeah and i think um i think it's kind of like making things fun in that way takes away from a lot of the anxieties that some people do have about technology and and these different platforms and you know i think there's still that narrative that goes on of people saying like it's taking away human connection and it's melting your brain and all these other things you know and it's kind of the more these are developed and they encourage some form of communication or connectivity or Mm -hmm. even just like sensory enjoyment and you know it's like like rem 5's done the vr for good where you're kind of using vr in a in a way that helps people um you know like encourages empathy and you can mm -hmm. use other people experience other people's perspectives using those platforms or um ar tools that like help people go through some kind of like relaxation anti-anxiety yeah. process so, so there's so many i think the more it gets built the more people would that that kind of weird dystopian mindset will disappear a little bit yeah. it's a tool i mean it can be used for, for good or bad i mean yeah and i think um well that part of it being a tool and, and kind of thinking of accessibility at least in in kind of through how i've experimented with with ar and and wondering what what you all think um especially for, for John, it's like, right, how do we, some of the stuff, the digital art that we're making anyways, how do we use AR as an extension and, and part of the workflow for that? Um, something that I was playing around with just this morning is that uh, through Sketchfab's app, you can now place your imported, maybe, it, maybe it's been that way for a while, but I was playing with it this morning, that three you know OBJs that I've uploaded to Sketchfab, I can pull up my phone and have them sitting in my living room, which, is pretty cool and it's a it's a it's a time too where it's like you want to you want to use ar for the medium that it is but at the same time if you're making stuff anyways and you can have it have an ar piece to it i think that that's really interesting um and just another kind of value add and another way for people to interact with stuff so i don't know if anyone has any thoughts too on that of like there's a lot of it's getting easier for people to try these apps out and to kind of dip a toe in the water but at the same time to really get the most out of the medium like you know zach we've all kind of alluded to there it takes a lot of thought and practice but i think for the most part we're all interested in like the more people that are trying these things and the more people that are um giving them a whirl it's just going to lead to a better more ar stuff in general that was long-winded but i think you get the the, the sentiment of where I was going. Yeah. I do like the fact that you can just put something out there, you know, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, at, at a typical show, you know, you, I'll set something up so people will look at it for a few hours and then I take it home, pack it up and put it in the basement, you know, but with, with AR, you can, it, it's out there. Like I talked about before, you can just send someone a link and it downloads the app and, yeah. and then there it is. And 10,000 people could, could, you know, experience it while I'm asleep you know so it, it, and then it's it's cumbersome at this point but I think I think it'll get more and more like that where the things that you do they just they just sort of exist mm -hmm. in some sort of library mm -hmm. yeah 
I think sort of, I think one interesting thing that we might be seeing the start of is sort of the growth of the uh, 3D model as a shared sort of file, like the uh, format that Hattie was discussing and how that's, um, there was a time when people, you know, trading images was, you know, actual physical images. And now we're communicating through, through, you know, very short videos with GIFs. And it might be that in the near future through AR, um, there's some more relevance to the sharing and expression through 3D models and 3D objects because you can now experience them and everybody can. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, um, and again, like having the, having those 3D models, um, if there is, and if there ends up being this kind of universal AR platform that people can use, it's like having them placed around the world, like in their actual geographical locations is another interesting thing. And like them existing in this online platform in an online archive, but them just kind of like existed like monuments you can go and see and you can travel to, which is another interesting thing. So having this kind of physical random archive of where they are, um, as well as their, their existence in like this digital platform, you know, for however long too. That would be a really great improvement for AR to have the, um, objects and en environments and experience uh, tied to GPS, you know, so that it, it it's tied to the location uh, rather than, you know, so many, of the, so many of the apps now have you set an anchor and then it, you know, kind of revolves around that anchor. But if, if, if this sort of universal platform we're talking about could truly, like you said, tie things to GPS coordinates, that would be a massive uh, improvement, I would say. I think, I'm trying to think, is it, I think Spark AR, you has the ability to do that. And I'm, I think oh, wow. Euphoria does. I think Euphoria does now as well. I'm not sure. I haven't tried it yet, but I um, have, I've known a couple of people that have tried it and I think it is tricky to nail it because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, GPS locations when you're not there. And I've talked with a friend of mine in London and we've talked about trying to do a project where like I'll throw stuff to locations in London and she goes to that location and sees if it's mm. there. And oh, wow. that like fun experience of being like, Oh, is it there? Like you go and check and I'm over <laughs> here and I can throw something to you in England and then you go and see if it's there. And it's like this kind of pen pal activity, I guess. And <laughs> yeah, I'm interested to try that because I, I think it's possible, but it's just um, probably a little tricky to get it dead on. Yeah, I, I've done a little experimentation with that, and we've done a little for a project at Pixel Farm. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the biggest obstacles for current or for right now is that GPS is only accurate within like a few meters. Mm -hmm. So setting it in a specific spot. Um, but we've used like a tool called Mapbox, which um, exposes like an entire mapping API, and you can place arbitrary points and stuff. And that's allowed us to like, yeah, it, it gets a little trickier with the further distance, but you can get into a general area like a three or four feet or yeah, three or four feet, you can usually get close to there. Um, yeah, the trickiest bit is actually pointing in the correct direction. Yeah, the, the, the GPS thought and the, the digital pen pals thing is interesting. Um, actually just a, a project that I've been working on over over the coronavirus kind of part that, that plays on that space between us, but still able to collaborate through AR is that, like I said, I've got buddies who, who are more traditional painters and they post a, a photo of their work. Well, I'm able to take that, use it as a trigger image, give it an AR component to it. I was using style transfers to basically have their painting melt in real time. I send them the app and then the, the QR code to download the, the video that basically plays on the trigger image and they go over to the piece that they just made, hold up their phone and they're like, Oh my God, like <laughs> it's, it's wild that you can kind of, you can kind of like backdoor into stuff like that, whether it's a mm -hmm. collaboration or not. I mean, and the, the, the piece still exists as this nice big painted piece, but at the same time, there's now this new layer to it. So, so those have been kind of fun and, and in a new way where it's like, I'm going to do this whether you like it or, or not, not in like a bad way. I mean, they're my buddies and, and they get excited about it. But like, as far as being able to do these remote collaborations uh, is, was, was pretty interesting. So I'm, I'm exploring that a little bit further. Um, yeah, that's a, that's really interesting. The idea of like, I don't know, like that, that 
when you're using images like the idea of ownership comes into it as well and it's kind of like you know could you go and see something that you pay there's something you pay to go and see in an art museum or an art exhibit and you know if there is it ends up being a platform that anybody can use and you manipulate that image mm. and then if you go in there like whether the artist or the institution likes <laughs> it or not you can do something to that image yeah uh, it's like a little pirate network almost yeah, exactly <laughs> you know you can start hacking things that you yeah. that people probably don't want you to <laughs> well and with a lot of these um so one of the you've mentioned euphoria i used to use like hp reveal that now is probably not going to become anything and have been using um ijack ar app and what a lot of people will do, it's almost like a, a king of the hill capture the flag for like the back of a $1 bill. Anybody can use that as their trigger image and kind of claim it and create a different animation for it. So that I think that's kind of interesting is it's something that's always evolving. And, and that same idea of like, well, I can recheck this and see what's going on with it today. Because mm -hmm. um, that's, that's something that I've seen that's really nice, at least through, through the apps that I've used, is that you can be doing stuff and updating in real time. It's good to go check it. Like it's a pretty, it's getting quick enough that that you can make adjustments on the fly, which I think for all of us, especially maybe in a, in a live situation where you got to change something up is, is pretty good. Um, minus maybe the, the back end rendering time and whatever, but as, as far as getting stuff updated. So that, that was kind of a question for John, because I know we've talked about it a lot in that, these apps that are rolling out like um, like iJack, like Torch, um, and also um, Frame VR, which is a web web based VR platform that I've been experimenting with. The the developer teams are pretty excited and active to get direct feedback. I mean, you said you you'll send messages to Torch and they'll like respond right away and and be super helpful. Like, what does that kind of mean to you in this day and age to get that kind of direct feedback and like really quick help in a world where customer service can be a terrible, you know, can be a terrible thing. So. Oh yeah, it was amazing. I mean, I, I got stuck doing uh, something with an interaction and an image tracking issue at like 11 at night. I couldn't figure out how to make this work. And so I, I messaged them and the CEO of Torch like created a video for me and sent it to me, you know, showing me how to how to how to do that. So yeah, the, that kind of um, assistance definitely does help. And and these yeah, like you said, these companies do seem very eager. Um, and, and I think they're very open to creative people too, because a lot of these apps and stuff. I know like Torch exists. I, I think they make their money on, you know, like real estate people showing houses and things like that. You know, so when people come along who are you know kind of pushing uh, the envelope and and trying to uh, find new uses for their tools I think I think that I think they get really excited about that yeah I think uh you know I've noticed that similar thing that a lot of platforms even if there's these kind of like upgraded versions you can have if you're a bigger company and you need to do more with it or you need to churn out a lot of stuff it's kind of they they do seem to have this always have like a decent free version of everything so if you're just a creator and you're just an artist or you just want to learn something it's still you know they they still want you to be able to do that and they're not necessarily trying to profit off you immediately when you're just kind of like a singular person trying to do that and also i think there's just so many resources online for learning um i think most companies now like one of their competitive things is like who has the most resources for their clients which is a really good thing or their or their uh, customers just people who want to use the software it's like who can have the best tutorial base and yeah. like a lot of ar platforms do that and then because a lot of them are linked like v4 is like linked to being used in gaming engines as well so um you end up with like the gaming engine want, wanting you to be able to use those things too and i mean there's also just people that the people that are good at it and make it themselves they the community tutorials are always really good as well because people just want you to be able to know how to do stuff and it's that kind of like freedom of information thing i guess yeah. um yeah so i think that's something that will hopefully will stay that way because there's a there just always seems to be the option and then um so we had a we had a question from uh, amir that i wanted to ask to everybody because I'm not sure how much um, exposure everyone's had to basically the, the new 
kind of wearable hardware like HoloLens and Magic Leap. So I've gotten to try on a Magic Leap last summer uh, and that was a really cool demo. And then I, I've used a HoloLens maybe like four years ago. The company I was at like randomly bought one, but that was, that was before I'd really tried any VR at all. And basically for everybody else out there, these are a lot of kind of what we think about of, the, of these, you know, more of a mixed reality headset where you've got glasses on and I can see all the walls, but with HoloLens, I'm using my fingers to shoot aliens that are literally burrowing through the walls in real time at me. And it's, it was, this was four years ago and that was still one of the most incredible things that I've seen using this space. So the, the question from Amir is even just whether, whether you have experience, maybe Zach, you know, kind of trying those on or a little bit more on the tech side of, of that. How do you think that those, as they hopefully become more popular will affect maybe your workflow or or your thinking around um, utilizing those type of tools as well. And I know we we mentioned, you know, John did talk about how those worlds might merge. So kind of in that realm, if anybody has any any thoughts on that. I, I think it'll help massively, like to not have to hold an object. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a, there's a, a cheap headset for the merge cube and, you know, it, it it's, not great, but um, but it does give you an idea of, of what that can be to just you know not have to um, have your hands on this thing. Um, so yeah, I think that will be revolutionary as far as AR goes to just have something on your face and just have both hands free. Mm -hmm. I haven't tried the, the 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 ones that you mentioned though. Yeah. And I've actually not had the opportunity to try any heads, any of the uh, okay. AR headsets yet. Um, when they've been around, like at work, I happen to not be around or whatever. Um, Convenient. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, I feel like they probably won't see public or like large public uh, acceptance until there might be like a that you know wonderful AR ecosystem through phones. Mm -hmm. um, just because the, the sort of utility of having that thing on you all the time, you need things to look at. Yeah. And so either you're going to have just, you know, things that are just pretty dull displays or, or it's going to be need to have that whole ecosystem built up. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't um, used <clears throat> them either I would be really excited to eventually one day <laughs> if I can yeah I think it would be it's like having it's I think people want to keep making the hardware that you use less and less cumbersome and less and less mm -hmm. clunky and I think that's been a challenge for VR is like the VR headsets you know ever since it came about I, it was kind of associated with this like lawnmower man kind of like 90s great movie watch it if you haven't yeah like 90s style kind of idea of the future and this headset being strapped onto you and it being this thing and then you take it off. And I think one of the biggest things for VR is, yeah, definitely trying to make it something that exists um, away from like putting that clunky thing on, experiencing it and then finishing and it being something that incorporates into your everyday life and having glasses that will interact with your environment would definitely be one way to do it. Um, I mean, it would also just be making it something that people really felt like they needed. Like, how do you get it to the point where it's an iPhone? So it's seen as like this necessity, but also something that everybody has. And it doesn't, mm -hmm. it's not so expensive that one person has it or just one person has a need for it or one type of person has a need for it. It becomes this like universal tool. Um, yeah. And I think that would probably be the really hard thing to do is get something to that point where it's mm -hmm. such a necessity and everyone feels like it's, something that they want and they deserve to have. Mm -hmm. Or that they're missing yeah. out on something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I need it, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, we're uh, maybe time to about wind down. I appreciate everyone's time. I kind of wanted to close with just, um, you know, go around and, and just hear a little bit about what's kind of next on as far as a creative project goes for you, whether it's in, in AR or not, um, just some stuff you've been either working on or, or thinking about, I'm interested. So let's we'll start with Zach and we'll go around maybe. All right. Um, well, I've, yeah, not been particularly productive outside of work in the last few weeks or 
but uh, I, I'm a habitual uh, tinkerer. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've been, yeah, I don't know, interested in exploring and I've been talks with uh, family who are educators, you know, exploring the ideas of AR in the classroom and that sort of thing. Um, but in a short, sort of short term thing, I have like a, yeah, a few uh, uh, VR sort of projects I want to dig into now that I'm stuck in one apartment. Yeah. Hey, well, any, any AR in the classroom, Yeah. your, your friends at REM5 are always interested <laughs> to hear more about that. So yeah, no, that sounds, that sounds like a really good use case. Um, and, and a lot of those uh, stuff that we've been exploring in our, in our, Thursday 1 p.m. Youth Innovation Labs are are uh, mm -hmm. different AR tools that um, that people can play with at home. You know, always good to have someone else to uh, to occupy the time. So really cool. Yeah. How about you, John? What's going on? Um, just kind of more of the same. Um, more interactions. Um, more people in the same space. Um. More collaboration, that's something I want to do. I mean, one thing with, with, with Torch at school is you can get different licenses for it, and then you can have people building the same space at the same time. That's mm -hmm. something I really want to experience. Um, a lot of my projects so far have been just kind of situated in the corner of a room. Um, I, I want to see if I can make something bigger and more modular so that you know people could walk throughout an entire space and and the objects in in the experience would be relevant to a bigger space than um than that so yeah um experimenting with sound like i said yeah so, yeah that's yeah. super cool super cool all right how about you hattie yeah i've um i mean i've been working on a couple of things i'm working on like a vr fly through of the grand canyon at the moment um using like real real height map data from google to make the landscape nice. um and i'm using unreal for the first time so i've been using unity for like years and i was like no i'm gonna do unreal because it's exciting and then i was like oh i don't have the right graphics card for ray tracing but you know but like that's hardware issues <laughs> but it's just i mean it's exciting to try and use a new platform and i'm getting frustrated because i you know, you always feel like you know everything when you have been using something for a long time and then you realize, oh, I don't know anything. <laughs> um, so that's a fun process to go through. But yeah, I've just been working on that. And then um, in terms of like my own artwork that I've been wanting to do, I've got a couple of projects that I want to execute eventually when I have time and have the resources. And one of them was trying to use um, the geo geolocations for AR and kind of see how far I can push that and see if I can kind of create things that other people have to go and find. Mm -hmm. um, and then also something that at the beginning of this whole pandemic that with museums closing, because like one of the things I'm really interested in and I'd love to do is try and use VR and AR and photogrammetry with like museum collections and making kind of online platforms with museums where you can kind of experience artworks differently or artworks that they don't have physically that you can experience in like the, the virtual world. Um, mm -hmm. And I, something I really want to do, which would be a long project, was trying to make, um, using web VR to make like a VR web, web page that you can interact with like on your phone as a VR piece that you use in a headset or just like clicking and dragging on a computer, but um, getting different artists with 3D assets, whether it's like 3D scans or their own 3D models and putting them into this like VR museum space that you can navigate around. But that's that would be a big project. <laughs> it's probably going to be like a few years in the making if I get onto that one. Yeah. Awesome. Well, super cool about the museum thoughts. Uh, again, your your friends at Room Five, if you want to partner up, we've been we've been having those kind of same yeah. discussions because it, it'll be it'll be interesting how a lot of those uh, a lot of those places and and really institutions need to adapt. Uh, not you know for the foreseeable future. Yeah. But, how can they still provide value and um, you know, and 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 kind of pursue their missions while people can't physically go to the space that they're all all about? So yeah, because one of the platforms that I know, like museums, are still doing a lot of artist panels and artist talks, which are really good, and that's always a great thing to have digitally. But yeah, it'd be interesting to see how they kind mm -hmm. of think about still having visual experiences um, and maybe even like spatial experiences through screens and through the virtual world. So. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all again so much. I'll probably just wrap up with a couple uh, shameless plugs. 
Hmm. Um, I also wanted to come back, John, if you want to post the, the link on where people can download your piece for Torch, if they want to try it in their house, oh, um, sure. that'd be cool. We can, I'll work with you to, we can put that in the Facebook live stream. And then, yeah, so we've got, a, we've had a couple artist panels um, now that are up on our YouTube page, just search for REM5. There's also a couple other artist talks. Uh, we have a an artist Facebook group for extended reality. We talk about a whole lot of different um, mediums, a lot, a lot of the stuff we we're talking about today, a lot of stuff that you can build for VR. So if, if anybody has any interest in diving in a little bit further and just kind of joining that group in those conversations, uh, you can just reach out to me directly at brian at rem5vr.com. And then outside of that, yeah, we're going to just be looking to have more conversations and um you know keep sharing the the cool stuff that people are working on while we're uh while we're away right now but <laughs> so thanks again everybody and uh we'll talk again soon and thanks for everybody who tuned in really appreciate it so thanks have so a much good one. thank you thanks. Go forth. thanks again guys